We are delighted to welcome Dr. Derek Cabrera and Dr. Laura Cabrera to the Sense and Signal podcast. They are systems thinking experts at Cornell University, where they founded the Cabrera Research Lab, which I guess investigates systems and systems thinking, right? That's right. That's right. And that has been a huge theme on our show, where we've wanted to examine leadership through systems thinking and through complexity. So we are incredibly delighted to have uh, you both on the show to, to share your knowledge with uh, Joda and I and help us continue to grow and our audience to continue to grow in their understanding of complexity and systems thinking. Yeah. 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 Well, we're excited to be here. Very excited. We love to talk about this stuff, obviously, because <laughs> uh, we do it all the time. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, and as I mentioned earlier, pre-conversation there, I did take your course about two and a half years ago, I think. Um, uh, found it fantastic. So um, super glad to have you two here. How did you get here? You know, with the, what, why are you why are you two doing this? Why are you trying to make sense of the world? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a great question. I, I did start off. Uh, I didn't. I I was a terrible student, so I uh, yes. dropped out of high school. And I really only had one skill, which was mountain climbing. And uh, so I became a mountain guide and I, I took people all over the world, uh, up and down mountains. Uh, for, really high mountains. Yeah, for oh, wow. a mountains. lot of years. The highest mountains. So yeah. I, I so I, do that. <laughs> <laughs> probably, you know, two, 200, 220, 230 days a year in a tent. And um, what I really kind of found was I, I had to understand all these different systems. I wouldn't have called them systems back then, I, but I had to understand, you know, climatography and, you know, the weather. And I had to understand geology. I had to understand the rescue systems, the, the physics of the, of the climbing systems, my body as a system and all these different systems. And then on top of that, I had to understand my clients and the psychological systems and the social, social dynamics. And I was really struggling to sort of say, how do I have one approach to understanding all these extremely disparate and different kinds of systems that have to be brought together? Because in the real world, they are together. They're happening together. They're not happening separately. So I really wanted to understand how to, how to think in terms of a system of systems, uh, mostly for kind of like survival and comfort. Uh, just to do better in the mountains and to do better for my clients and 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 uh, to be safer and all that kind of stuff. And so I just started thinking about those things. And then it wasn't till it, my life's been kind of a little bit of Forrest Gumpian in, in the <laughs> sense that, uh, you know, I didn't plan any of it. And it was sort of like one mistake after another. And uh, I think that's how a lot of our lives are like. <laughs> when you look back, how did I get here? <laughs> how did I get here, right? <laughs> So I definitely didn't ever think I would be, you know, a, a systems theorist or a, even a scientist, but it turns out I've probably been a scientist my whole life and um, ended up coming, long story short, I'm skipping a bunch of stuff, but long story short, ended up coming to Cornell, doing my PhD here, um, and uh, met Laura on a National Sci Science Foundation grant where they wanted to take my theory yes. that I'd done, developed, and um, and make it accessible to people. Cause at the time it was kind of mostly just mathematical and pretty much only, I've only taught it to scientists and doctoral students that I could, you know, sure. grab. And uh, so Laura, I met Laura because she's an expert in translational research, which mm -hmm. is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I did not have an exciting Forrest Gumpian kind of way. I was <laughs> sort of that traditional A student all the way through school the one thing I think that sort of set me apart is I really wanted, I was really fascinated with how do we take all of this rich knowledge and this research and these theories and things that were coming out of our brains and our universities and really understand it in a way and make it more usable and, and really to better sort of the human condition. I mean, I, I was a, a child of an early divorce and I was always fascinated at how systems were affecting my family. And so I came, came at it from this sort of policy area of, how do we really understand what we know and how valid the things are that we know and how right. do we use that, you know, to, to make things better for people. And then we, it was we, the first day of the grant. Yeah. We, we were sitting the in the day. airport going to a conference and sure. I, she said, well, you better tell me what this theory is. 
So I told her scribbled <laughs> on the back of the on the back of the uh, plane, plane ticket. ticket yeah. <laughs> and at the end of it, I said, "So do you know what we should do?" Because I have no idea what we should do. And I'll never forget. She said to me, "I know exactly what we should do." And I said, "That's great," because I <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> she said, "We need to go teach kindergartners." Yeah. Nice. And I was like, wow. So why did you say that, Laura? Why why did your mind gravitate to kindergartners? Well, I think because, well, I had heard about his theory and, and about him before we started the grant. And it all seemed very complicated. And when he really just reduced it to its four foundational elements to me, literally on the back of a, a plane ticket. And I could just, I understood it immediately. And I thought, well... This actually doesn't have to live in an ivory tower, an academic setting, not just for faculty. And if we can figure out how to teach these four things to tiny little minds who are working on what are the colors and right. you know, the different states of matter and understanding history, <laughs> then if we can get it to a place where they can use those four things as tools to understand that content, we can get anyone right. to use those to understand any sophistication, more sophisticated content, right? So, so like there's the everyday and then the sort of wicked kind of things that we think about, the complicated things. Right. And so it sounds like this could be an additional chapter to everything I ever l needed to learn. I learned in kindergarten, the systems <laughs> think thinking so. chapter. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the, the things we teach today, we teach the, you know, Silicon Valley executives. We teach the, the top policy people. We teach it to special forces you know, really, you know, technical scientists, we teach the exact same things to kindergartners. Yeah. There's no difference between well, what we teach kindergartners and what we teach those folks. But kindergartners are a little bit more open-minded. <laughs> <laughs> so, and precocious. So what, so for a kindergartner, and, and we, we want to make sure that oh, maybe some kindergartners are listening to this podcast. I doubt it, but they're, hopefully their parents are. And yeah. to baseline our conversation how do you explain what a system is to a kindergartner or a podcast audience member or our podcast audience members? Yeah. Well, systems are just the things that are out there in the world that we, that we're interested in, right? They're all, everything around a systems is just kind of a very abstract concept that just means like stuff, right? Right. So you can just call it stuff. What stuff are we interested in? And whatever it is that you're interested in is kind of, complex. If you really delve into it, we find out that it's pretty complex. And so we want to we want to kind of pull it apart. And so we want to break it into parts and understand the parts and see the relationships between them. And sometimes we don't break it into the right parts. We break it in the wrong places. And so that's called m distinction making. And you know, you you want to make sure that your distinctions that you're making are the are the ones that nature or, or the stuff is making. Um, and sometimes we come at that stuff from a particular perspective right. and that perspective causes us not to understand that stuff. And so we have to make sure that our perspective is not super biased or things like that. Right. And it's very simple things like that, that, um, yeah. that, you know, you, you do those things over and over again and pretty soon you're thinking in a very complex and systemic way. Hmm. Well, and also with kindergartners in particular, and actually I was just thinking maybe not just kindergartners, they, if you, if you try to get them to understand systems in relation to themselves, because children are very self-centered naturally and biologically, because they have for to good be, reason, for yeah. good reason. Mm -hmm. So are some adults. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're saying, supposed to move out of that, right? Thinking, like, you know, if you have them understand things in relation to themselves and the kinds of things they're thinking about. So like when we're talking, I, I wasn't kidding when I said, when we're, we're working with kids to understand that they're distinguishing between red and blue and yellow and green, they're grouping colors into primary and not, you know, there, it's just literally speaking to people, people to, into their cognition of distinct, distinguishing things, organizing things, relating things, but in the context of what they're thinking about right then and there, that's why what we're doing is from kindergartners all the way up to whatever you think is whatever the highest, the highest level is, right. So I, I can imagine, you know, obviously systems thinking is a, just a powerful tool and it's a manifestation of the logic that we've been building upon since the, 
Aristotelian days, right? We're, yeah, we're building yeah. on this. It's um, shoulders and you're just, we're narrowing or not narrowing where I don't know what the term is, but it's always been, it's always, it's a, it'll be, it would be, it would have been a useful tool a hundred years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, probably. But do you think today it's more important for some reason or other for people to be thinking in systems? Is there a special, is, is, is there something happening now that, yeah. you know, kids, you need to learn about systems? For sure. There's, there's a quantitative reason why, why systems thinking is more important today than it was. And that is because we're more interconnected. And when you have more interconnections, you have greater complexity. So the fact that, you know, we, we were chatting about COVID, like the fact that, that a virus can make its way very quickly from one side of the planet to the other, because it can hop on a person who hops on a flight, who makes it to a different country very quickly. That's an interconnection that didn't used to exist. Right. Well, that interconnection and all those interconnections increases the complexity. And that increase in complexity, whether it's social media interconnections or whether it's physical travel interconnections or people interconnections, all these interconnections make life more complex, period. And so the more complex things are, the more complex friendly your your thinking has to be because you have to, in order to get it right, get it, meaning life, reality, <laughs> You've got to think like reality does, and reality is just quantitatively more complex. Is that what's our proof of that? I've heard people question that lately. Actually, on a LinkedIn post today, David Snowden did he well, question it was, that? No, it, was, you know, it was somebody else. <laughs> we'll get to David Snowden later. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's a teaser for the audience. Um, yeah. But. We perceive, like, I would agree, like I would say, yeah, to me, based on my life experience, things seem to be just getting increasingly complex. And I think when you talk to the people, they see, seem to say the same thing. There are others that are like, but really, are we, can we check our biases or check our, our assumptions on this premise? How do we know things are getting more complex? Yeah, I think just from, again, from a, like a quantitative network theory, using network theory, which is one of the system sciences, um, when we increase the interconnections, especially in kind of uh, non-patterned ways, meaning we don't connect everything to everything, but we actually kind of have strange connections and long form connections and things like that in a network, that network by definition increases its complexity. Right. And so, you know, just quantitatively as well as qualitatively, our social networks are more connected. Uh, our physical geographical networks are more connected. Things used to, you know, there was a time maybe 200 years ago or 100 years ago even, if that virus started in Wuhan, it would have stayed in Wuhan. Yeah. It wouldn't have come all the way right. over every ocean. It would have just lived and died there. And that would have been the end of it. Yeah, I also, back to your question, Joda, about why systems thinking may be more important now. I think it's what you said, which is the interconnectedness. But I also think there's this phenomenon that I have seen in the last five or six years that's really become more punctuated where because of all of this information and because of all the different venues by which we get information, we're starting to set up these sort of echo chambers where we're yeah. just reinforcing only what we want to hear or what oh, yeah. we believe. And then the ability for people to manipulate that and try to create that bifurcation or those polar that polarization, to me, the um, the answer to that is actually to develop systems thinking and metacognition for everyone to be able to test their assumptions, check their bias, not just take things at face value, but look for validity of things and not continue. I mean, the path we're on is pretty, um, what's the word? It's, it could be dangerous. It could be dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> That's so human centric, though. What about the bacteria? Yeah. I'd be totally happy if we're. <laughs> right. yeah, you... I, I, yeah, I think systems thinking can actually help to undo that. And yeah. you, have, really you have a, a term that you've coined to describe this the VUCA? Yeah. VUCA. We didn't coin it. Actually, it was coined by the military. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, and. Um, popularized and now it's kind of known in in business circles and policy circles and all kinds of people use VUCA now. So what does VUCA mean? Volatile. 
sorry, it, it means volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Uh, and that is a pretty good description of, uh, of the reality, right? That, that's a pretty good description of, of the way things are in the real world. They tend to be volatile. They tend to be uncertain. You, we don't know what's going to happen always. Uh, they tend to be complex. That's probably the one that's hardest to define for folks. And they're ambiguous, which seems kind of... Which is tied to complexity, to yeah. Yeah. Can, kind you, of a, can yeah. you explain um, uh, what complexity is? We use, you know, like you said, we use that word a lot, right? Because it's part of just natural language. But I'm sure yeah. there's also a scientific approach to thinking about it as well. Yeah, this is one of my. I, I hope. Uh, I hope that more people could understand what we mean when we say complexity, because a lot of people mistake what we mean by it. And I think probably the most, if, if you ever want to read a, a single page, that is the most profound page you'll ever read about complexity. It's there's a a page long article called "Let's Call It Plectics." Plectics, interesting. But, yeah, let's call it Plectics by Murray Gelman, who was at the Santa Fe Institute where I uh, did my my postdoctoral work and uh, was a research associate there. And and um, Murray Gelman uh, won the Nobel Prize, and he wrote this one page. And the reason he wrote this one page was to try to get people to understand that we probably shouldn't call it complexity because it's going to confuse people. We should call it Plectics. And the reason he wanted to call it plectics is because the root word plec is the same for complex as it is for simplex or simple. And what he was getting at in this single page paper that any person who can read could read, it's not technical. Um, you can just search it online and you'll find it. I'm doing it right is, after this interview. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally that there is this beautiful and deep connection between complexity and simplicity. And that connection is that the agents of a system, which could be anything, they could be ants, they could be people, they could be uh, dance partners in a, in a dance competition, that could be an agent, it could be a company inside of a, a market, it could be a market inside of an economy, it could be a, a country inside of a world. Any of those things could be agents. And um, those agents, follow a set of simple interaction rules. When they interact with each other, hmm. they follow rules. And the, and the combination of all those interactions lead to surprising behaviors in the system. And they gave that term, uh, that surprising outcomes got a term called emergence. Emergence. Which confuses everybody, right? Everybody's confused by emergence. I but actually oh, did a, I actually looked it up the other day because I, I feel like I've used it in five different ways, but I conflate those five different ways every time I use it. Yes. So it is a overloaded term. You it know. Is. All it means is that there's surprising things that come out of the system as a behavior that you wouldn't expect to be in the system if you just look at the agents, right. let me give you an example. If I take an ant colony, the ants are in a little hill and they go out and, and, and what's amazing is each individual ant is effectively dumb. You know, they're not very smart. They can't figure things out. They're kind of like robot like minds. But then, so you say to yourself, I got this dumb ant. And if I took a hundred thousand of these things, what am I going to get? I'm going to get like extreme dumbness, right? Because <laughs> when you put dumb with dumb, you're not going to suddenly get smart. You're going to get dumb, real dumb, right? I know some groups but, of humans yeah. are like that too. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? exactly. So you wouldn't expect for it to start being smart because every one of the ant, individual ants is effectively dumb. But what happens, which is surprising, which is emergence, is the ant colony starts to act in ways that are quite intelligent. And you say to yourself, well, if that intelligence isn't in the ants, then it must be something that the whole is greater than its parts. Well, that's not true. The whole is always exactly equal to its parts, always. Where is that intelligence? It's in the interaction rules that the ants follow. So when the ants meet up with each other, they have a couple interaction rules. One of them is go out and find food. The other one is 
if you find food, shoot pheromones out of your butt. And the third one is if you ever run up against a pheromone trail, don't cross it. You've got to go left or right. And those three rules together create the intelligence. So the intelligence is in the system. It's not a mystery. It's not magic. It's in the system. It's in the simple rules. And those interaction rules are like relationships between the ants. And so the relationships are part of the system. So they're also parts of the system. Right. So the parts and the whole are exactly equal. The only reason we say that the, the whole is greater than the parts is because we're ignoring the relationships. But if we don't ignore the relationships, the whole is exactly equal to the parts. And there's nothing mysterious about emergence. Interesting. Yeah, is, your, is your name really actually Harry Seldon? I'm just saying. I'm sorry. <laughs> I've been watching the uh, the foundation, and Harry Seldon is the main character who uses mathematics to discover emergence out of society, yeah. and then be able to qualify that as moving forward. Yeah. So. That's right. There's nothing mystical about it. it. It it's just that it's hidden in the relationships. Interesting. And I think that's a good segue to the David Snowden controversy, <laughs> or maybe it's not a controversy. I'll just call it a controversy. If, for if it is, it's a one-way controversy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I think it's that idea that uh, what I saw on LinkedIn, David Snowden questioned. And so for listeners, David Snowden is a management consultant. He founded the Cunevin Sensemaking fr- Framework. And he spends a lot of time, I've discovered on LinkedIn, challenging people's ideas around systems thinking. And, you know, and he, he questioned your premise on LinkedIn recently about the, 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 the idea that the, the parts are not greater th- the, than the whole, right? That the parts are just what they are. Um, yeah, and, and disputed your definition of emergence. So what, yes. what's your, what are your thoughts about that? I don't really have any thoughts in particular about uh, uh, David Snowden or his work because, uh, like you said, he's a management consultant. And so, like, it doesn't align with really the science of complexity, which if you want to understand the science of complexity, the number one place in the world to, to be and to, to hear from is the Santa Fe Institute. Um, they they really have have pioneered the science and the study of complexity. Um, And so, yeah, I think one of the things maybe that I I heard you say that he said is that that, that complexity theory is like the new thing and systems thinking is like old and kind of like old fashioned. That's my interpretation that he's trying, he, his premise is that we need to move beyond systems thinking into just complexity science. Yeah, that's absurd. And and what he's what he's talking about in the Kinefin thing is not complexity science. It's not scientific. There's no empirical basis for it. There's no peer reviewed studies for it. Right. Um, the the complexity that that I'm talking about is the complexity that is studied by scientists, you know, all over the world and in, in many great universities. Um, and that complexity is a quantitative and qualitative description of how certain types of systems behave. And systems thinking is a particular and specific one of those systems. It's the, it's cognition. Right. So um, these systems are called complex adaptive systems and our thinking is a complex adaptive system, but so are all the other systems that you care about, like your children, the economy, your customers, a business, an organization, it, you know, your liver, those are all complex adaptive systems as well. And so systems thinking is just one complex adaptive system, which is the, the apparatus that we think with, the cognition that we think with. And, um, and so to sort of say that one is old and I mean, thinking is probably the most complex system that humans know of, that we're aware of. Right. And so it is it is the primary complex adaptive system that we care about because it's the one that we really don't fully understand yet and um, and is part and parcel of everything we do and think and say and behave. And so it's a pretty important CAS uh, complex adaptive system. But complexity is really about those kinds of systems, not that particular system. Right. 
Does that so, explain that? Yeah, and I'm wondering it, for the audience and me, um, it, at the risk of being reductive, it, it sounds like it's a comparison of apples and oranges. They're kind of not the same. You're, they're they're complementary. One one that they're not the same thing to be comparing against. That that and and if I'm hearing that correctly, but if I'm not, what is what is complex is is there a complexity theory as he's postulating it or is it simply as you're saying you know because i believe i've read that he says it's not a model it's a framework does that sound resonate complexity is a framework no his framework is a framework uh, right. which is which amounts to an opinion because there's no <laughs> empirical basis for it so when we say like framework we we really mean like somebody somebody's opinion there's no empirical data that supports what he calls complexity. There is tremendous empirical data that supports what scientists all over the world are studying called complexity. And, and it's emerging and growing all the time. And it's a huge edifice of, of peer reviewed studies and, 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 and science around the study of complexity. And there are multiple definitions of complexity, just like there are multiple definitions of, of species. Right. Uh, and, and what makes a species, right? There's there's 21 different ways that biologists organize, you know, uh, life on the planet. And similarly, there's different ways that we attack complexity with different definitions. And, and I admit, most of them, you kind of have to have a little bit of a mathematical background to get into um, to understand them. But the story that I just gave you about the ants is precisely what those mathematical things say right is if you understand the simple rules that underlie the complexity then the complexity really isn't that mysterious it's it's the interaction rules and the agents that are creating the complexity right and i want to get into your framework the uh, uh, dsrp framework but before we do that why why should people in leadership positions care about this because right now, this has been very abstract. Yeah, there's some controversy about definitions. And you've got a management consultant who's telling one story. You've got a scientist over here, you, telling a different story. Or maybe there's some overlap between them, too. There's probably a Venn diagram of overlapping ideas as well. Um, but why should leaders care about all this abstract stuff? Well, they should care because they're they're in charge of human organizations, which are by definition complex adaptive systems, right? The agents right. in that system are the actual people inside of the organization. A leader has the ability to, through their sort of mission, execute some simple rules that they want everybody to follow, which over time collectively will lead to hopefully an emergent outcome, which a lot of people would call a vision or a goal state, right? So complexity, uh, complex adaptive systems are incredibly relevant to humans and human organizations because they are uh, by definition those things. And so if a, as a leader, if you understand that and you understand that your greatest leverage to have the effect that you're trying to have in, a, have in the first place is by thinking about the agents in your system the rules that they need, that you want them to follow. Now, I don't mean rules like, you know, go to bed at 8 p.m. I mean like <laughs> behaviors that we want. Over. Interaction rules. Interaction. Like when I see you, Which I'm gonna, I'm gonna do X, Y, Z, yes. and you're gonna do X, Y, Z, and that kind of thing. And that's then, about building a culture, right? Exactly. Yes, exactly. And 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 what's amazing to me is, you know, we work with a lot of executives and leaders of different types of organizations. Is you know, I, I don't think that people, leaders, all leaders sort of understand these sort of natural functions of any system that apply to their organizations, right? That there is a goal state of any system, which in leadership talk is the vision that there's an, you know, an executable set of operations, which in leadership talk is sort of the mission. Well, right. all systems have these things and they also need to have capacity to execute that mission. And they also need to be collecting feedback. So we know that all kinds of systems are doing that, um, human systems in particular. So I think, you know, it might seem abstract, but when you just sort of pivot it into what it means for human organizations, it's incredibly relevant and incredibly powerful tool to be aware of it all. Yeah, one way to think of it is like in the last hundred years, we've, we've as organizational leaders 
tended to think about organizations almost like machines that yeah. we could manipulate. Yeah. And they're really much more like a biological thing than they are like a mechanical thing. Yes. So if you treat a biological thing like it's a mechanical thing, you're probably not going to get it to do the things you want it to do. And a human organization is is literally a biological thing and a social technical thing. And it's it's a mix of all these things. And if you want it to do what you want it to do, to have the outcomes you want it to have, then treating it more like a living ecological thing yes. than a machine is probably going to get you better results. Yeah, Another complex think, system, essentially. A complex going, adaptive system. Yeah. Yeah. Going back to the Venn yeah. diagram, I think that's a place where you and Snowden would absolutely agree. Right, that you'd use that same exact metaphor. No, I Dan, would, keep the controversy. There's no, no, no agreement here. No, there's, no, there's not, I think there doing? would be an agreement. Um, <laughs> but wait, so I am. I work at a corporation, like an organization. I've worked at all my life, very large organizations, and um, and I have seen like you, like you, David, Derek, like like I've seen the the problems of people not looking beyond or perceiving their world as a simple situation or, or maybe ignoring the complex and, and the cascading effects. But I've also seen leadership. What? I don't know if the word is willfully ignore or not know what they can do about it or things like that. And it oftentimes attempts to prescribe these solutions, mechanisms um, yes. to solve this is met with use whatever word you want to use skepticism, consternation. I don't want to hear. I, what, I don't know what, it, or, or Yeah. In a nutshell, sticking with the with the leadership side and the teams, what has been your experience of trying to get people to understand this? And what have been the biggest roadblocks mm. to get people to integrate this mechanism? Or has it been, hey, it's finally the Jesus moment. Yes, this is great. <laughs> or with organizational leaders in particular or particularly, uh, yeah. yeah. I think, you know, it's a mixed bag that, you know, some people are going to just take it up quickly and some people are going to keep going back to their normal kind of routines. And, um, but I think when people are struggling with complexity and, and you show them how to think differently about this system so that they can think more in alignment with this system, right? they they pick it up very quickly and they see the value of it very quickly there's a there's an old i mentioned i was a mountain guide and and uh or you did or somebody did and uh i at the end of my career i was a, a river guide and um and i still i still do mountain guiding on the side but the oh, yeah. um <laughs> the uh the thing i always noticed about river guides is you always had these young river guides and then these kind of old crusty timers right like jonah you know the jonah. young guys <laughs> young guys were like big strapping they'd have their shirt off and they'd be like muscling it through and pulling the oars and all that stuff and that boat would be doing what it does and the old guys would kind of just be sitting back and you know they'd have a shirt on and and and, and they you know wait for that moment where their boat was where it needed to be, and they'd put one oar in the water right. and so hard the boat would turn and the river would hit the back of the boat and then the boat would go where they wanted it to yeah. go. And I think that's a great metaphor for what organizational leaders and why then question why even care about complexity. Oh, that's cool. Because when you understand the dynamics of this of the river, which is the environment, the context, then you can make smarter, you can literally work smarter rather than harder because you're never going to have enough muscle to fight a river. Right. But if you use the river, the river can do anything it wants with the boat at any time. Yeah. yeah. And if you know the river and you know when to do it, then you can be very attuned to the environment, the context, the market, the organism, which is the boat, which is your company, you know, the people on the boat, all their strengths, their weaknesses, all that kind of stuff. And you can do the right thing at the right moment to turn the boat or to have some, the the power of the river turn the boat to get it and set up for the rapids. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. makes some sense. Oh yeah. We, yeah, we for sure. all work in higher education and you know, the pandemic has taken its toll on higher education institutions. And one thing I know at my school, I imagine are doing it at Cornell too, is thinking about strategic planning and how to 
to address the situation we're in because we're coming out of the pandemic and then we have this population bust on the horizon uh, that might impact enrollment as well. How, from a complexity point, point of view or a systems thinking point of view, how should we be engaging in strategic planning? Because I think to, to, to what you said, there's a lot of mechanic mechanisms in that or a mechanical engineered viewpoint in a lot of strategic planning, a lot of tailorism and outcomes focused yes. thinking. And it doesn't give a lot of room for, I believe in complexity or systems thinking is called the uh, uh, adjacent possible, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. where things can emerge if you don't couple things too tightly or, uh, or try to control things too tightly. Um, so what are your recommendations about how executive leaders and leaders and organizations should be approaching strategic planning and program planning in a complex environment? You want me to take a stab or you want to go with that one? Well, I was just going to, I'll start. And yeah, Do it acapella. <laughs> <laughs> Do a musical version. <laughs> No, I mean, I was just thinking, like, I think about our experience at Cornell when the pandemic, you know, at the height of when it was really at its worst and and how such a massive organization actually did a very, in my opinion, a very good job of handling it and, and sort of pivoting. Uh, and I think, I mean, I have sat in on some of the more recent strategic planning things for our- It doesn't always um, do a good job, but it, it did a good job this did. time. Okay. But I will, say, <laughs> I will say that I think people are now- I know this is going to sound strange, but they're planning for things to be VUCA. They're planning for the unexpected to happen. So they're putting more um, flexibility and adaptability in their systems with purpose, knowing okay. that you can't predict everything. That would be how I would think about it. I mean, you probably, we always have different answers. Yeah, I would just, again, I would just use kind of a, a mountain metaphor Same or something mountain. like that. You know, like you, you, you have to have a goal. Goals are important. So you have to know where you want, you're trying to get to. But I think in str in strategery or str strategics <laughs> uh, or strategy planning, sometimes we spend most of our time telling how to get there. Right. Instead of being very, very clear about where we're trying to get to and then being very clear about who's going to be a part of it and how they should interact with each other on the way and then let them find the way rather than saying this is the precise way that we'll be going because we don't know if we're going to run into a lake and have to go around it or if we're going to run into a bear and have to go around it or if we're going to run you know run out of food and have to go back and get you know whatever metaphor you want to use we just don't know all the details but but the goal is probably going to stay the same we need to make it to this spot and maybe even by this date but in between here and there lots of stuff is going to happen. That's where the complexity lives. That's where the right. VUCA world is. And so be less about the, the how and more about the what is it that we're trying to do. That's our vision. Who Who's doing it? That's our mission. For what reason? You know, and what are we going to do interactively to get there? Those are the simple rules. And then do we have the capacital systems? Do we have backpacks, food, blah, blah, blah? Do we have the capacital systems to do it? And then do we have a healthy ability to learn along the right. way? And that we call that VMCL, vision, mission, capacity, learning. And that's sort of systems thinking for organizational leaders. But the learning part has to be very purposeful yep. and um, unbiased. And you have to be willing to take the toughest of the feedback, take it for what it's the yeah. value of it and then adapt to it. Yeah. But isn't all feedback bad faith? I thought that's what someone told me. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> we always do this nod to organizational learning and we have to learn and we have to take feedback. But we yeah. mean like you have to purposely design really well-oiled systems for getting that feedback, yeah. listening to that feedback and acting on it. And I think yeah. we don't really take, people sometimes shortchange that because it's sort of, seems fluffy. Could that be your next course? Because I think that's a course unto itself, learning how to be active listening and learn how to take feedback yeah. and also learn how to give feedback. I think those are two things that are lacking in organizations. Yeah, that should be. It's so thing. critical. And, and it, there's a great saying, which is, uh, I always mess it up, but uh, it's like, no, no, uh, no news is bad news. 
<laughs> good news is no news, and bad news is good news. Yes. In and terms of feedback. And so yes. can you learn to see the bad news as opportunity? Can you learn to sort of see the good news as kind of like there's not much you can do with it? And then no news, of course, is terrible, right? If you're that's not getting right. any feedback, that's like, oh my God, you should that's be really right. worried. I had an analogy I often use um, with people where I say like, if I'm in a boat with a bunch of people and we're rowing someplace and I go, I would much rather have a bunch of my team rowing together in the, in the wrong room. direction sure. than rowing, not rowing or, and everybody rowing in the, everybody rowing in their own direction or not rowing going in circles. <laughs> You'll be going in circles because at least if you're going the wrong direction and you do what Dan and I was saying, ABCD, always be collecting data. Then, you know, as a team, when you realize you're doing the wrong thing, you'll be able to maneuver. Whereas if you are right. always at dysfunction, then you're, you're never going to go anywhere. And so it's kind of aligns with that thinking. I believe Collins and Porras at St out of Stanford came up with some research that actually showed that in organizations that that even when you could like retrospectively say, boy, the, the strategic decisions that these people made were clearly wrong in context, but they they were wrong with a great culture. Yeah. Right. And they still succeeded. And so yeah. they show like it's more important that you have a great culture together and doing the wrong thing than doing the right thing in a way that's not together. Right. Yeah, so, uh, but I think they actually did some research on that empirically that turned And you're out. happier too. In a weird, yeah. you know, the team, you're just happier. You're, you're, you're kind of, even if you're kind of sucking wind, you're like, Hey, I'm doing it with a bunch of people I like. Yeah. So. And because yeah. of complexity, believe it or not, the reason that that allows itself is because of complexity, because complexity has so many different degrees of freedom that there isn't one right way to do it. That's right. And it's right. because of complexity that that's true. So that's why we should care about complexity that was also. That's a good complexity very combat. Important. Yeah, good that complexity was a complexity combat. <laughs> that was epic. That was actually really good. <laughs> yeah. That was well done. So I, I want to make sure we get a chance to talk about the DSRP framework and what yeah. is that and how can we use it as a, how can leaders use it as a tool to help lead their organizations? Well, let's break it into two questions, what you just said. So let's okay. talk about what it is, and then we can talk about how leaders can use it. So if you imagine that your brain, we talk, we've talked about if your brain was like a game, and anytime you're having an idea, there's four rules to how you're going to have that idea, right? You're going to distinguish something. You're going to make a distinction. You're going to, um, you're going to relate things together. You're going to maybe organize things into groupings, and then you're also going to take a perspective, right? So there's four things. There's distinctions, systems, relationships, and perspectives. And for any person to have any idea about anything, their brain actually does those four things. So it's like the rules of the game of having an idea, right? Like a chessboard yep. almost. So that's what it is. And it's those four things are foundational to how any person comes to understand anything, right? And so that's why kindergartners use DSRP to understand colors, numbers, whatever, whatever it is right. they're thinking about. And executives are using DSRP to understand their market, their audience, their new products, any of those things. Um, so that's what DSRP is. And and it's really how we are building mental models of the reality around us, right? How are we building the mental models that help us understand and navigate reality? And for us, becoming aware of how you're doing that is sort of the greatest tool you can have. Because when you're aware of how you're thinking about things, you can actually think better about anything, right? Because right. you're thinking about what you're thinking, not just, you're not locked into the content of what you're thinking about. You're also, you're also understanding how you're thinking about it. So that becomes like a tool set you take from any situation or any topic. You might have a different way of saying that. <laughs> oh, no, it's, uh, no, I would just add to that. Like, so we call that, uh, that awareness metacognition in yeah. science is yeah. it's metacognition is just awareness of your thinking processes. And the research on metacognition is super powerful um, and, and super conclusive in terms of its effect, its good effect. When we increase metacognition, we increase success in all domains. That's the, the net, yeah. net of metacognition research. So you don't really get to choose whether you're doing DSRP. Yeah. You're doing DSRP all the time. All of your audience right now mm -hmm. is doing DSRP. 
what you get to choose, just like you don't get to choose whether gravity is affecting you right now. <laughs> what you get to choose is whether you're, whether you're aware that you're doing DSRP. And, um, and that awareness, according to the metacognitive research, is a big deal. Right. That's the easiest way to say it. It is a big It's deal. a big deal. So it doesn't really even matter. Like the, the DSRP is just the rules. And the rules are kind of irrelevant except for the fact that they run everything. Like it doesn't matter whether you like the rules or don't like the rules, whatever, just like the ants. It doesn't really matter. The rules are what's causing the outcomes. Right. So if you wonder why your brain does the things you do, why you predict the things you predict or behave the way you behave or think the things you think or feel the things you feel, the reason why that's all happening is because of these simple DSRP yes. rules. Right. And you can imagine if you are a leader and you have teams of people, if you actually had a team of people who could actually understand how they're building mental models about the same things, they're all thinking about the same things because they're working on something together. If they understand how they're building their mental model of that thing, then the differences in how people on a team, on the same team are thinking about maybe a product, if you can see the differences in the mental models you're building, then you can actually get on the same page much more quickly about how to move forward with a project mm -hmm. or a product or anything like that. And, and so for leaders to really focus on systems thinking for their, for their team members and to get people on the same page, then also if they know how to share their mental models, it, it creates a language of thinking so people can sort of see how they're thinking about things. If we had a disagreement about something, which doesn't happen often. No. But oh, if really? we did. <laughs> yeah. That's your next Tell us more. We need to know about this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We work together and live together and everything. And we very, very rarely fight. Maybe DSRP is a magic. We can just, yeah, so, yeah. Helps. Something think about it. Yeah. It helps it, to know the language of it because you can be like, well, that's your perspective. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. And you're seeing different distinctions than I'm seeing. But put that oh, in yeah. That's right. Yeah, put that in a business. Say we're fighting over some feature of a product we're developing. And instead of it being a fight about me versus him, it's about his mental model of how the product should be That's and personal. my mental model of how this he personalizes it. Yeah, it's it much less personalized. makes it very different. And, yeah. and so right. you actually increase communication, you get people on the same page faster, and it changes the entire dynamic of how things are done. Yep. That's fascinating. And people get wedded to distinct actually first off I want to say I love DSRP. I use I've been using it ever since I took your course. I apply it as much as I can. I've actually used your Plectica. I think it's Plectica, the yep. the uh, solution, which I think is absolutely awesome. The only issue I have with it right now with the is um I was using the free version. I don't think we were able to lock it. Uh, anyways, anyways, we can talk about that offline. But <laughs> my only, my biggest beef with DSRP is it doesn't sound out a really cool word. I'm trying like, I can't, I can't yeah. get a good word out of it. But um, I'm wondering, so when I do apply it, Laura, like when I look and I bring it to a team and I, and I've actually presented your stuff and work in various places. So I'm, I'm, I'm like I said, I am an evangelist um, to help people think about this stuff. But what's interesting is, like you said, it's it's not just a framework, and I'm not sure if I'm using the word correctly. If you want to qualify as a framework, but it is a mental model of how we, how you said the humans, we naturally progress through thinking. Whether we are actively engaging in a cognitive way or not, that's a separate story. And you're pretty creating a a step by step process. And you made kind of a point in the course that. Albeit it is, a C, it does one, two, three, four. It's iterative, and you can bounce around. I feel, and depending on the on the stuff, I have found that starting with distinctions for me is the best way to introduce it. Just because there's such a big win, because I have found distinctions is where things just go wrong. My distinction is different from your distinction. All right. And we don't admit that we move forward six months down the line. It's like an outcome has occurred and it's like, Oh, we won. And the other person's like, we didn't win. I like, I thought, mm -hmm. and then we finally realized our distinctions weren't. And I, I made a comment. Just, just, just getting distinctions. And I was thinking, am I wrong in thinking maybe just kind of training people and making distinctions first and then move to the next phase of, of thinking of systems is that, or is, should I kind of introduce them all to the whole thing? Cause I, I don't know. Yeah. I'll stop. You're not, you're not wrong. I mean, we don't really believe in right and wrong in that sense, yeah, but I will say, I mean, if you, it's, it's no different than solving a problem before you've defined the problem. 
right? So distinction, <clears throat> distinction is critical to sort of setting that frame, getting the common terms, having everybody sort of understanding the thing. So we talk a lot in class, our students love this. We always say, don't start solving problems, start understanding systems, right? You have to understand that landscape and that is the distinction, right? What is the what is the set of variables that are involved, and how would we define this problem, distinguish it, and then you can move to. But but you're absolutely right that a lot of yeah. times people start with a set of distinctions that that get in the way of the yes. rest of the process. That's and if you true. challenge those distinctions up front, you can sometimes open it up. Um, in the same way, it's almost like if you had like a sick child or something, and you're like. The problem is they have a fever and you're like, no, that's not the problem. That's that's one Something. of your body's solutions yes. <laughs> to the problem. Right? Yeah. So if you yeah. decided that that's the problem right away, then you're definitely not going to understand the system. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, 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 totally. And and it does they do seem to be at each other to some degree because I kind of made a I made a distinction with Dan and I we talked about it a little bit where I said, well, you know, if you at the stage of systems said the heart is part of the nervous system, you could find yourself in some weird m medical outcomes because it's technically not part of the medical of that. You know, you might get some cool accidental, but then make sure you kind of are if you get the systems right, if you don't get the systems right, then if you start looking at the relationships then you can find yourself in a world, not a world of hurt. You're always collecting data. You're always figuring out, you'll go back and you can, you know, yeah. but yeah, I, I do see a, a, a point. And, and, and again, I'm just talking from an educational perspective. I, and, and I'd be curious, I get a little pedantic about this stuff. How would you, how would you approach this? Of course you have a whole course and, you know, and everybody's going to take your course. And I just, I was just kind of what I've leaned in on is let's just, focus on distinctions. Can we agree on distinctions first and move forward and move forward from there? And I've, I feel like I've gotten some good value out of that, but maybe I'm missing the mark. And that's why you guys are and I was thinking maybe get some information on that. So no, I would, I mean, DSRP is happening simultaneously all the time in your brain. So you can start with any of them mm -hmm. because you're basically going to be ca playing catch up with your brain anyway. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, you know, generally speaking, what I would recommend is start where people are at. So if you see them, you know, in order to loosen up them up on distinctions, you might have to get them to take different perspectives, yeah. right? Yeah. Because if you get them to take a different perspectives, they're going to see different, different distinctions. Uh, that's a good point. Those different perspectives. So, yeah, you know, you, you kind of loosen them up with a body shot and then, you know, kind of <laughs> go up something like that. I mean, I think the answer is you can start wherever you're at and whatever. I mean, sometimes you have a, a something that's on hand that like it really is somebody's not recognizing a relationship that actually exists. So you're going to start there or, you know, we have had people, many people try to make the argument that P should be first. Yes. Because P oh, changes up. Right. So like it, perspective, because if you start with perspective, the perspective yeah, yeah. I think is going to change the distinctions I make, the systems, the way I organize stuff what relationships I see and don't see yeah. versus another perspective. So I think the point is that you can start wherever you're at. You can you know, use any one of them as sort of an, an entree into whatever problem you're thinking about. Um, but, but your brain is doing, doing all them, them all at the same time. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Always. Always. No, I love, yeah. I love this framework because, I mean, I've always said, well, not always said, because uh, maybe in the last few years I have said, Leadership is really about consciousness, right? That you're leading not only your own consciousness, but other people's consciousness as well to mm -hmm. some yes. desired outcome. And I think this this framework speaks to that as a sense-making tool and to get teams together to make sense of their environments in order to move whatever initiative they want forward. Yes. That's absolutely right. For sure. Yeah. Can you... Use system is, is is it overkill to use system think, thinking on simple problems? No, no, not at all. We had a a, a devastating problem feeding four 130 pound dogs and realized we needed to use systems thinking to actually. <laughs> you know, how are we going to do that without creating absolute chaos? They would just create chaos in really? our kitchen every twice a day. And so <laughs> We're feeding, the, we're adding to the chaos by doing it. So we created in a crazy some different way. rules, right? We made, we put the food closer to the scoop, closer to the bowls. We got different bowls that don't 
scrape across the floor. We got bowls with over. rubber on them because the relationship between the bowl and the floor was that when the dog ate, the f- the thing would slide across the floor. So yeah. you have four dogs sliding, sliding four bowls <laughs> full of food and water across the floor, and it would just make a, an absolute mess. So you have to think about the relationship between the bowl and the dog yeah. and the and the floor. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, now we have a system that just is seamless. That was system. We we systems. We kind of. Satisfied or optimized it or whatever. That's awesome. So if kindergartners can use systems thinking, I think leaders of organizations can use systems thinking. So do you have an example of a kindergartner using systems thinking to solve a problem? Uh, Sure. I mean, there's um, a million of them. The fire truck. Oh, the fire truck. Yeah. So we had a um, kindergartner, a kindergarten classroom they were learning a lesson on, it was one of the common core standards on community helpers. Like who are the people in your neighborhood that you can Police, trust? Police, fire, you right. know, all that stuff. And part of the um, lesson was they actually had uh, the fireman with the truck come to the school to explain to them who the firemen were, why they should be afraid of them, all of that. And um, one of the, you can also interject if I'm missing details, but- They had a the, little song that they learned, right? Before every, him. Yeah, so every, they had a song and I don't sing. It was just like every <laughs> hole has parts every and every part, part is a hole that has parts that are smaller and like they would sing it. So then they went. Oh, to nice. Back. Yeah. Yeah. And then they went to look at the fire truck and one of their assignments was to actually build a replica of the fire truck in the classroom using cardboard and milk cartons and egg cartons. And, and they had done this every year since like the beginning of you know education. Yes. So, so we know exactly what they do. So the year right. before they learned about part whole, which is just the S part of DSRP, um, they had, you know, a box and like a steering wheel. But then once they actually learned part whole, what the teachers found is they actually had many, many, many more parts to their fire truck. And meaning, the parts had parts. Yes. And so on and so on. So instead of just having like a ladder, yeah. which was always part of the truck. It would, the teacher said there'd be four wheels, a front, a back, a steering wheel, and a ladder. That would be what every year what they'd get. This year, we taught them a one-minute song about part and whole. Yeah. And, they, and we said, go out and part hold the truck. And they went out and they went, well, it's a ladder, but the ladder has parts. Yeah. It right. has these, these cross things. And the, the cross things have parts. It's got this grippy tape on it. And so they're making new they're distinctions. They're seeing more. They build and draw more complex fire trucks. Right. So they're right. seeing more of the world. Yeah. And that was from a one minute intervention. Okay, but humor me for one more minute. Yeah. So then, um, so then after that, they well, had right, a um, trip to the apple orchard to go. Oh, nice. It was fall to look at apples, and the you know the people are talking about apples and parts of the apples and all of this. And one of the kids said, Hey, he sent, he actually sent us an email. His teacher sent an email and they said, Hey, doctors Cabrera, we were at the apple orchard and we think we've discovered a new part, an undiscovered part of the apple. And they sent a picture of it and it's that bottom fuzzy part of the apple. And they had named it the belly button. They wanted to distinguish it. So, so they, they named, named it, they oh. named it the, yeah. the belly button of the apple. So see, they're already That's doing awesome. it. Right? right. So then, and they wanted to know whether we could tell them whether scientists knew about it. knew about the belly button of the apple. <laughs> they said, "Can you talk to some of your apple science?" <laughs> and so he he actually did. He, he contacted a friend in one of the bots <laughs> agriculture things, and they sent us a video of how that part is formed. It turns out it is an actual part that's been discovered called the calyx. But we were able to send them then a video of how that part was formed. But the point is. They thought it was a new, they were looking for parts. They thought it was new, right. but they knew they didn't have to name it. Which is right? science. I mean, that's how scientists do it, except they call it a calyx instead of a button, okay, belly but button. One more, and then I'll be done. So no, then no. a These few days great. later, yeah. few days later, sadly, they have a lockdown because oh. of an incident at a local prison. So all these little kids are put in the closets, put under the desks. They have all these, you know, it's, it's chaos. It's frightening. They're like four or five years old. They, they're all doing all this. They're being quiet. They're locked in the room, which is terrifying for any kid. At the end, I'm going to cry. I'm not going to cry. At the end of the lockdown, this little four-year-old child comes up to the teacher and says, Mrs. Smith, 
and he, you know, they're scared. He says, can we part whole the lockdown? Oh, because wow. he, they wanted to understand it better. And they knew that this was a way that they would. So they learned a one minute song about part whole. They applied it to a fire truck. Yeah without even being asked to an apple orchard and then without being reminded to a very scary event. Yeah. Right. That's called our transfer that like the, the educational implications of that are massive. Yeah. yeah, yeah that's part yeah. of their cognitive schema now. I mean, it's that's there. right. That's right. Laura. I mean, that makes me think of that, you know, that phrase was it the limits of my language means the limits of my thinking. Yes. And you've introduced language to or and models to. Yes. Right. So tease out reality. Take that experience into kindergarten and fast forward that into a shared language of people who are trying to cure cancer, understanding the different distinctions they're making, the mental models they're building about parts of the process, and having that language to really communicate more effectively and and have... And all the different perspectives we actually need and different types of scientists yeah. that we need on an interdisciplinary team in order to solve cancer. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> We haven't cured cancer yet. You think we, it'd be better if we got kindergartners on that soon? Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe those kindergartners are now old enough because that was several years. It'd be better if we taught them to think when they're kindergartners, yes, for, for sure. sure. I yeah. mean, we, yeah. we're, we're in this age where information is effectively free. Yes. So, yeah. so power isn't in the information you have. Power is in the ability to organize information. Yes. And what DSRP does is it tells you how your brain and how nature organizes information. Yeah. And so Would that- Would you say it's a, we, it's a fo form of information literacy, the framework as well? For sure. Definitely. Yeah. It, it, it's the thing that gives information meaning. Yeah. Right. When we organize inf information in and of itself doesn't have meaning. The only time it has meaning or becomes a mental model is when we organize it and give it meaning. Structure. Right. We structure it. But also think about not just information, but misinformation. Yes. Yeah. Right. This is what I was Which talking is about. More important. Like systems thinking, metacognition, DSRP. It's to me, it inoculates us against being manipulated, against not recognizing we're, when we're being fed misinformation. Our own bias, echo bias, chambers, all, all these things that get in the way of us right. getting reality right. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Well, Dan. We, are we at the hour here? I, I mean, think do we, we are at the up? hour. How <laughs> how can folks get a hold of the doctors Cabrera? I like that the doctors Cabrera. How can <laughs> I folks, do too? <laughs> how can folks get a hold of you and and take your courses and? Um, well, we have, we a, have a, website a website for our lab CabreraResearch.org. dot org. Yeah. Um, but there's courses on the website. There's courses at Cornell. There's LinkedIn. courses at LinkedIn that I think are, I've, I think those are free or something. They're I don't know how the LinkedIn oh, wow. yeah. works. Yeah. There's courses in everything we've talked about, DSRP and VMCL at, on LinkedIn. Um, th so there's there's lots of courses out there that you can take. There's books, uh, Systems Thinking you Made Simple. You can also just and email us. Flock, not clock. And you can, yeah, you can always just email us and like find out more. Um, okay. Okay. Well, we'll definitely put your contact information in the um, the show notes so people can reach out and um, uh, find your work because it's really important mm -hmm. work. And I'm, I'm super, I, I, f I definitely find the work that you're doing with kindergartners the most inspiring because I think the more you can get that cognitive schema formed in their minds and get that habit of thinking, that's going to be good for society as a whole. Okay. Agreed. I agree totally. That's, agree. That's well, right. <laughs> that's this one <laughs> you guys are awesome thank you so much for joining us today this has been a good conversation Definitely. Um, thank you this yeah. is a great good, great conversation uh always I yeah think, you know people are gonna people we live in a complex world so it's good to it's good to have a cognitive an ability to do cognitive complexity and stuff yeah. yeah, yeah. And we might reach out to you again. Sometimes we have panel discussions. Maybe we'll get us noted on here and we can get the two of you to have a conversation. You know, it's like, <laughs> the, debate. <laughs> the debate. There's not much to debate. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, uh, I think sometimes in this new social media world, it's, 
the way to get popular is to just like attack people, people yeah, that are saying yeah. things. So yeah, well, I will say sure. I've been on LinkedIn for a long time. You don't have to stop the recording because maybe this will be a good piece to this interview. Yeah, yeah, okay, go for it. I have been on LinkedIn for a long time and it used to be boring and bland, right? People yeah. were just posting jobs. But now there are these kind of provocateurs on LinkedIn. I would say Snowden's one. There's this other guy named Adi who's uh, in in uh, from I think he's in uh, the United Kingdom. And there are a few others. And interestingly, they're all working within the complexity space and the systems taking space. And they get into these fiery LinkedIn debates. It actually makes it more entertaining to be honest. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, if you if you want to understand complexity for the for your listeners, I mean, really, that some of the books that have come out of people at Santa Fe Institute. There's one right. called uh, Complexity by Waldrop uh, or Murray Gelman's uh, Quark and Jar- Jaguar. Those are accessible books. They're not super technical. You know, I would suggest reading things like that that are more um, kind of scientifically driven because otherwise yeah. I think you're in a world where it's just a lot of people's opinions and, and yep. most of them, most of the debates that they're having are not debates that scientists are having. They're, they're right. just like, um, they're nonsense. The cacophony <laughs> noise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. Like all social media. media. Like all social media. Yeah. And that's kind of where Dan and I sit too, unfortunately. No, no, hopefully we're not. We we're trying to cut through the cruft. So that's yeah. that's the goal of this 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 podcast. Um, well, again, thanks you too. I appreciate it so much. I was looking forward to it and it's all I was expecting and hoping. So I appreciate it.